I see what they like in terms of movies, books, music. I hang out with them during recess and I listen to them. It makes me, obviously it makes me and everybody else around the community extremely disappointed that teachers continue to spend more out of their own pockets. As I said before, I am a big believer in growth mindset and social emotional learning. Any teacher, whether you're new or a veteran teacher who is struggling with their mental health, Take the load off where you can. Young students are having so much screen time. We see a decline in motor gross functions, fine motor skills. Full of Sunday scaries for teachers. I don't have them because I'm spending Sunday preparing for my week. I've, I've never heard of that. I hope a lot of teachers are doing that. That is probably one of the most beautiful and positive things I've heard, which makes a genuine difference for students' confidence. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features in-depth interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Whether you're seeking inspiration, motivation, or simply looking to learn something new, The Avenue of the Strongest has something for everyone. With engaging and thought-provoking discussions, this podcast is the perfect source of entertainment and education. Today, we have a very special guest joining us. Ms. Tanya Diaz is a seasoned curriculum developer for over 14 years and an elementary classroom teacher. She's an expert when it comes to creating engaging classroom activities. You can find her on social media under Gift Teacher 305 and for teachers, you can find incredible classroom resources and activities on Teachers Pay Teachers by searching for Gifted Teacher 305. Welcome to the show, Tanya. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me. I'm glad that we're doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I want to let you know, as soon as I was taking a look into your profile, I was absolutely blown away by the pictures of your classroom. You definitely, and I'm just not making this up because I'm speaking with you, but I genuinely believe you win the award for the best classroom I have ever seen. I can tell you for certain that growing up, uh, none of my classrooms look like that. So I do have a lot of questions, but before I get started, I, Valentine's Day is right around the corner and you shared an incredible picture and it'll be up on the screen for viewers to see, <laughs> but it looks beautiful. Not only that, you did all of that for around $20. It blows my mind. Uh, my first question is, how long did it take for you to come up with the overall idea? And then how long did it actually take you to like decorate that entire classroom setup? Okay, that's sort of a trick question because I've been doing what they call classroom transformations for a while now. So when I did that one, I had been doing classroom transformations for a while. So it didn't really take me a long time because I'm constantly planning for my next one. Mm. So for the ideas, it really comes from the kids. I really want to have a student-centered classroom. So at the beginning of the year, I survey the kids. I see what they like in terms of movies, books, music. I hang out with them during recess and I listen to them. And so a lot of the ideas are not coming necessarily from me, are coming from the kids. And that really creates a vested interest in the activities that we're doing and high engagement. So the these Valentine one really came from seeing the kids coming back from pandemic and having a lack of social skills. They were not interacting the way that they usually interact. And I want always my classroom to be a safe space for making mistakes mm -hmm. because that's how we grow. I tell them a mistake is not a mistake as long as we grow from it. So I wanted to instill the sense of kindness. And I know that Valentine's Day is so commercialized and I really wanted to make it easy kindness. So I bought those balloons and I said, you know what? Let's have the kids write on the balloons, kindness and SEL, social emotional messages, growth mindset messages, but it is already Valentine's. So I have trained them into thinking in that sort of way. And I was, I knew that they were going to write some beautiful messages. So the idea is you have this balloon and throughout the day, all your peers are going to write something about you. That's amazing. That's supportive. That's going to make you feel good. And at the end of the day, everybody walks away with the balloons, right? The Cost a dollar. <laughs> right. And at that time, I had about 15, 17 kids. And then the rest of the decor that you see in the picture was black bulletin paper from the school. So I didn't have to pay for that. And I already had multicolor paper that had been donated by a parent. So that was less <laughs> than $20. Um, I printed the stuff on school printer. And really, the rest of the money comes from 
extra little things that I bought, like these little bumper cars that we use. So that was like another dollar at Dollar Tree. So it all came out to $20 and you can do it without the glow lights. So mm -hmm. if you have the black lights, those were a donation that I got through Donors Choose. So I didn't have to pay for anything. So that's how you had that low cost to do that activity. And it's really just the bright color paper that makes it look so amazing. No, that's incredible. And the pictures came out uh, truly, truly amazing. And I love the fact that you are using all the resources you possibly can. And then where you have to go out of your way to obviously purchase some things you do and keep it low cost. So I want to focus on that issue. So for new teachers that are just starting off, I imagine it's a struggle to find cheap, low prep classroom ideas. As a teacher, you're expected to come up with lesson plans and activities, assign homework, grade, document progress, and so much more. For a new teacher, though, that seems very, very daunting, especially when you know you need to keep your students engaged. So obviously, when I'm asking you this, you know, you've already been doing it for so many years. You are a master classroom transformer. <laughs> but how about some general tips for the new teachers? Is there any kind of if there's certain so first of all, they can go to your uh, your website because you have amazing resources uh, and and ideas here. But are there any other websites or even like brick and mortar locations that you could recommend? I know you mentioned Dollar Tree, but where are some things for a new teacher starting off? Like, hey, if you're a new teacher, don't waste two hundred dollars on one activity. Here is my advice. So a lot of what I do, um, transforming, making the classroom look different. I learned that. Bulletin paper is my best friend. You can cover walls. You can put tests together and put the bulletin paper over it. It looks like a table cover. You change the colors. It gives the room a completely different look. So that bulletin paper, it's going to be your best friend. The other thing is, yes, Dollar Tree is fantastic. If you want to cover the walls and the bulletin paper is taking a little long, those plastic table covers are super cheap and you can cover a whole wall for about $3. But again, you don't want to spend a lot of that go to donorschoose.org. There's another website called nair.org. They get donations from companies and all you're paying for, and they, they have a ton of supplies, could be markers, could be, depending on the donations that they receive, they have a ton of supplies and all you're paying for is the shipping and handling. So that's amazing. You have local like organizations here in Miami. We have Ed Fund. The education fund is amazing. You write you're at grants for anything that you want to do in the classroom and you'll get money and you'll get all your supplies taken care of. So it's just about being a little bit creative. Also at the beginning of the year, I always show what are my intentions for the year when I have that orientation. It's easier for me because I'm already established teacher and I have all these pictures that I can show the parents, but just tell them this is my intent. This is what I want to do with the classroom or even showing pictures of somebody else's like transformations. This is what I'm looking to do and I need your help. And getting them at the beginning of the year is key because everyone's excited to start the new year. Everyone wants to help the new teacher. So I would actually plan out ahead of time, what are some key things that I really wanna do with my students and have the parents donate at the beginning of the year. I mean, I've taught at Title I schools all my life and you will always, not everyone can give, but you will have enough if you ask way in advance and continue to ask and communicate. That line of communication with your parents is really important. That. The other thing is like, go to flea markets, ask friends, ask the veteran teachers. I would lend my stuff out to other teachers. And, and when I became a coach, I was having, you know, they would come in and I'd have bins for this transformation and they'd go and borrow it. And I maybe we would replenish some things, but you don't have to do it on your own. It really should be a community effort. That is such great advice. I That is, that is really good advice for new teachers. Now, it's interesting, right, because you, 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 there are so many different options for donations and using classroom resource and asking veteran teachers, but I still want to talk about a very important topic. Despite all of that, despite all of that, the National Education Association released some horrifying data in October of 2022 stating that educators this year, on average, are spending over $800 in out-of-pocket costs on school supplies. It makes me, obviously, it makes me and everybody else around the community extremely disappointed that teachers continue to spend more out of their own pockets. Uh, I, I, it, it's a fun fact. IRS does have an educator expense deduction. It always used to be $250 forever. They finally increased it to $300, but it's funny because that doesn't difference when you're paying $800 or $1,000 or $2,000 out of pocket. It's absolutely ridiculous. 
Now, I, I did see several years ago, you shared a post where you said you on average spend anywhere from, I think it was five, it could be up to $2,000 in a single school year. Is that correct? That is correct. I actually wrote it down. 2K is usually what I spent is, you know, I add it up at the end of the year before taxes to find out. And this is with donations and with additional things. And I mean, I choose to do that. Not all teachers can do it, number one, right. or want to. And it's okay not to want to spend your money, your hard earned money into back into the classroom when you should have those things already made available to you. And a lot of us are working a second job, which is how I was able to do that. By working a second job, I was able to spend those $2,000 or more. Yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. The fact that you come up with a $2,000 expense, even going after donations and various sources, and you still have to spend that amount of money. And But you're right, though. As teachers, you want your classroom, you want your kids to be fully engaged. So it's like, it's a, it's a lose, lose situation, right? You, you, you know, that every te I've never heard of a teacher that said, Hey, I do not spend a penny out of my pocket. Every teacher that I've spoken to said, admitted every single year. Yes. They spend money out of their own pockets. So it's, it's a serious issue. Um, it's a serious issue that needs to be fixed because honestly, I don't think it's fair for teachers to go ahead and uh, spend money out of their own pocket, especially when teachers are underpaid. This is another discussion we can have. For, we can make <laughs> entire, we can make this entire video about how teachers are underpaid. Uh, and so I'll tell you a very quick, interesting story. Uh, we own a private preschool in Brooklyn here, so we employ 20, 27 full time teachers there. And I would go into the DOE budget meetings, and every time, every year, we go in and we say, "Hey." This is not fair. We have a teacher here. She has a master's, she has a bachelor's degree. She has a master's degree and she's certified. And this is your max band of compensation. I mean, how do you expect to attract and retain talent? Uh, this is why teachers are leaving. And it's, 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 it's heartbreaking also because teachers look at us like, oh, you're evil. You're not paying me more, but it, you know, everything is at a budget. DOE gives you a contract and they give you specific compensation for teachers, for assistant teachers, for staff, and for supply, for admin costs. And so it, it looks like a very complicated problem. But, you know, talking about these issues, I believe, does help. And we need to keep spreading this awareness to make sure that this, you know, we change some policies over here. Um, and I, I do want to go ahead and sh uh, let me share my screen over here. Let me know if you're able to. Do you see my screen here? I do see it. Okay, perfect. I'm, I'm seeing that. <laughs> so you you shared something very beautiful, uh, as, and I think everyone can resonate with this. I have 20 years of experience, but I can't afford to fix my car, see a doctor for headaches, or save for my child's future. I'm a teacher in America. Second post over here, my child and I share a bed in a small apartment. I spent $1,000 on supply, and I've been laid off three times due to budget cuts. And then finally, I have a master's degree, 16 years of experience, work two extra jobs, donate blood plasma to pay the bills. I am a teacher in America. The, that, the, that is a very, very powerful uh, uh, a post that you've shared with us here. As a t I mean, so, so, so this, is, this goes into my next question over here. As a teacher with over a decade of experience, what advice can you give to current teachers who are struggling with their job? Uh, and obviously, we're not going to talk about why, because it could be the low pay, it could be the school admin, but what general advice can you give uh, just to teachers who are struggling currently? Uh, I think number one is your mental health, because without that, you cannot. Your health and your mental health, you do have to find support in other teachers, other communities. And sometimes it's not going to be your school community. Sometimes, you know, for me, it wasn't my school community. Like what I did in the classroom, everybody at school thought I was crazy. Like, why does she do these things? And I found support and a lot of social media friends that I found and just other avenues, joining associations and really speaking your mind and reaching out to politicians and to those representatives that are in your area and really local is best like when you're reaching out i i, I have a background in political science i was a legislative aide right out of um college so local is best you want to talk to that local administ city administrators those that are really going to impact 
you. Yes, state senators are important. And yes, at the federal level, but the local is really the best. And getting informed and putting your needs out there because unless you're in their face, they're not going to know. Mm, no, that that that's... We, we need to be politically active. I don't think... I think we're seeing more of that now. And I have to say I've taught elementary and I've taught at the high school. And I find that at the high school level, teachers were a lot more active. And I don't know if it's at the elementary level, if it's we have more response. I don't think we have more responsibilities, but something's happening where I'm not seeing as much, at least in my experience, I'm not seeing as many elementary school teachers being more active. And there's so many more of us at yeah. the elementary I feel like if we were a little more active and really putting it out there, and I know that we have other organizations, but we have to talk the talk and walk the walk and really mean it. I, I feel like we're seeing it more now lately. People are leaving the classroom, but, and find support in other teachers because no one really understands right. <laughs> what we're going through in the classroom like other educators. No, I agree. No, thank you so much for that insight. Now, enough with the bad. I don't want to make this a, a depressing conversation over here. I, I, I do, of course, definitely want to spend some time and talk about the good and how beautiful teaching really is. There was a picture of you that you shared almost six years ago where your students surprised you on your birthday. As soon as I saw that, I was so happy. I mean, it's you can instantly relate, but I, you know... I, what, how does that ha what does that happiness look like? I mean, you must have been extremely just overwhelmed with joy and happiness when you walked in with the, it, it, into your classroom. I was more than overwhelmed. I, I, I think I cried. It wasn't even in the classroom. I was walking. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Um, I was walking in and two of the boys dressed like men in white and men in black. Okay. And they, had a clipboard and they had a clipboard and they said to me, if you want to get into the club, we got to check if you're on the list. <laughs> and, you know, they flipped up their glasses and I'm like, guys, I got to get, I got, you know, I love, I'm big on time. I got to get in there. I don't know what game you guys are playing. No, no, no. Oh, so I played along and I said, okay, my name is Sanna Diaz. Yes, you're on the list. Come this way, ma'am. I'm like, okay. And then I get to the classroom and, you know, walk into the hallway and I open the door and they all jump out and they had rearranged the classroom. Wow. They did is transform the classroom for me. Wow. And this is fifth, is a fifth grade class or? This is fifth grade. I'm getting a little for con thinking about it because they know that I transform the classrooms for them all the time and they did it for me. And the parents were involved because there was cake. There was food waiting for me. The desks were rearranged. They know, <laughs> they know that I love Adam Levine from Maroon Five. They had oh, Adam Levine from Maroon Five on this uh, car. Birthday. I love you, Miss Diaz. Happy birthday! <laughs> wow, that that is that's that's incredible. So they, they planned that for a while, and it was overwhelming for me. But when you invest in kids, that's what happens. A heart. Yeah. Sure, you're investing and when you create that type of environment where we all support each other it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing so i love that that is I, i'm i can't believe that you brought that up but um yeah and and they're they're just amazing kids are great i feel like you can as an adult we make mistakes and we kind of harden ourselves but we kids even when you make a mistake in the classroom like the next day is brand new right and they're holding these grudges they just want to, they want to be successful. They want to do well, just like the rest of us do. So it's it's an amazing job. I, I love teaching. I love giving back. I love to see when they thrive. I love to see that light, you know, shine in their eyes when they're struggling with something and they finally get it. And you know that you were part of that success. It's it's amazing. There There's no high better yeah, than that. That's, that's, a, that's, that's what I was thinking. Now it's 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 I I I'm actually I'm curious. I don't think I've ever asked I definitely did not ask this question yet to a teacher. Do you get nervous at the first day of school at all? That's that's something that's that's I don't know. That's something like that sounds like a really good question to ask. I get nervous all the time. And I've been teaching uh, years all the time on the first day of school. Um uh, you know, I'm nervous. What are the kids going to be like? And I want the, the classroom to be just perfect. I want them to feel comfortable. Um, I always tell them this is our classroom. It's not my classroom. It's our place. And if you really think about it, how much time they're spending 
in the classroom with you, some of these kids are spending more time with the teacher than they are with their own parents. Right. I really want the classroom to be a community, like a second home. So I, I, I'm really nervous um, when school starts. <laughs> How do you usually prepare for the first day of classroom? I know you have to get your classroom in order, set up the classroom, but are there anything else that you typically have to do before the first day of uh, school? Yes. I, again, mental health and taking care of yourself. I make sure that my lesson plan some point, my classroom is some point, so I don't have to worry about the little things. Everything's set up. I think about how the kids are going to walk into the classroom. How do I want them to move? All of that is done and set. What can I do to put myself at rest? So I make sure that I take a walk or I exercise. I make sure I get enough sleep. I make sure that I organize my outfits for the week. I make sure that I meal prep. All of that takes a lot of that week stress of what am I going to eat tomorrow? It's already planned out. The week is set so I can concentrate on more important things. And I'm not stressing about these small details that can really make us anxious and, and be nervous. Wow. I love that you said that. I think that's and that's a very good advice for any teacher, whether you're new or a veteran teacher who is struggling with their mental health. Take the load off where you can, with, with just preparing meals or figuring out what to wear. Those take a lot. They, they cause a lot of mental exhaustion. You wake up, you're like, oh my God, what do I wear today? Well, this outfit does not look good and I don't like this and I wore this yesterday. So just pre-planning those things, uh, it, 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 it alleviates a lot of that stress. So I'm, I'm glad you implement that. And I think that's really good advice for anyone who's struggling, who's not yet practicing those things. And then the thing is, it also opens up your time. Yes, it does take a little bit of time to plan it, but if you're looking at the long range, and that's, I, I think I got that from planning as well. I used to plan per week and then it was every two weeks. And then I got to the point where I was planning by month. All my lessons were planned by month. And it allowed me to see the gaps that were coming and how I could support this gap three weeks from now and how I can spiral review three weeks from now with this other gap that was happening. And then that kind of led me to do food prep and things like that. And so now in the morning, I'm a total, I'm a mess in the morning. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I get up and my, my outfit is already set. So all I have to worry about is really getting my tea or my coffee and I'm out the door and my, and my lunch is ready. So it does take a little bit of time on Sunday, but also doing that food prep creates less anxiety for me during the week. And it also helps me prepare, you know, what they call the Sunday scaries for teachers. I don't have them because I'm spending Sunday preparing for my week. So right. that does me, you know, it lowers my anxiety and makes me feel better. No, that's incredible. I want to go ahead and slightly shift uh, the conversation, but still talk about something. So teachers are constantly bombarded with new ed tech startups with huge funding that have released a website or some kind of application to help teachers in some way. I think it's again fair to say that again it's overwhelming for teachers to find the right app or the website. I'd like to just learn some of us learn about some of your favorite apps or website that you use in general or can suggest to other classroom teachers, whether it's for math or English or science, it doesn't matter. Just hey, this is a cool app. I've used it. You know, any any kind of uh, favorite or interesting apps uh, or web applications out there. Yeah, I do. I have my number one is Class Dojo, and I'm sure a lot of teachers know about it. But Class Dojo has so many features that teachers don't know about. Not only like the timer, simple things like the timer. It has music that you can play in the background. It has an area where you can set up like my do now, what I call do now in the morning. I'm very big on making sure that we don't waste any time in the classroom. So as soon as they walk in, I would have my Class Dojo telling them what were the things that they needed to do had the little timer. So it really helps me organize with the kids. It helps organize in groups. It helps organize individually. It can randomize for you. But what I love about Class Dojo is that it also has these video series on growth mindset, SEL, and you can play those at the beginning of the school year. So Class Dojo can be used in so many ways. I love the communication with the parents. And if you really are communicating with parents, you can print out the reports from and those are great for when you're meeting with parents like I would have one of the things that I would check in the morning with the kids was not just attendance through class dojo but also did you do your homework where you prepare for class and I can just print out that report and I would be ready for a parent meeting like you know why is my child struggling well he's shown up to class unprepared this many times what can we do to improve that 
That's one. I love Padlet. Padlet is great when you want them to respond to things and you get to see all the work and not just respond to a question, but is there a project or something that they're doing? I can have it all on the screen. And if you have multiple classes, it's amazing because you can see all of them, all of their work at once and they can compare. So that's another one. Blue Kit is great for games. I love quizzes because it gets them all excited about competing with each other. Uh, Flipgrid, I love because, well, formerly Flipgrid, now Flip, because the kids can record themselves. Mm. And I love whenever you can give them ownership of their learning is a great thing. And then there's an old one called Flickers, which I love because you get instant assessment when you're assessing them. If you have the questions in there, it'll literally assess it and grade it for them and it'll show up on the board and everybody knows you know and they know. Okay. It won't tell you the kids' names, which is great, but it tells you like 10 out of 20 kids got this incorrect or correct. And then you can talk about, let's talk about this now before it becomes an issue. So I love that. And I love augmented reality. So Merge Cube and Quiver are fantastic apps to work and um, I love Quiver because they can be used color pages and they come alive 3D so you could use it. I used it during pandemic. Okay. And, and I used Merch during pandemic which was great for hands-on. So, and the kids love anything, you know, it's techy and- Right, de- right. Okay, well talking about techy, how do you find the balance as a teacher between online, uh, like online resources and offline. Let me clarify what I mean by that. There's been so much commotion and so much talk about so much screen time. Students are having so much screen time. Young students are having so much screen time. We see a decline in motor gross functions, fine motor skills. We see it at the preschool level. We see it at the K-12 level. All this technology has come out. We have social media where we get instant gratification instantly. Our attention spans are decreasing, even for adults. I mean, it, it's not just children, but what is children? It's it's very important because they're they they're not even teenagers or adults yet. How do you, as a teacher, find the balance between, hey, like, my classroom is is it too tech heavy, or is it not too tech heavy? How do you kind of fine tune that balance as a teacher to make sure that it's 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 a balance? It is a balance, and I think. A lot of times it's a personal thing. Some people are very comfortable with technology and some people are not as comfortable with technology. So someone that's not going to be as comfortable is not going to be as techy. Although school does push for, we have to use this program, right? So if there's something that I have to use, I make sure I use it. Right. And of all those apps that I mentioned, I don't use them all the time. You have to be selective. Like my class dojo is something that I use every day because it helps me with classroom management, but I'm not using Padlet all the time. Right. It's not appropriate to be used all the time. I'm not using Merge. Merge is something that I will bring when I, I have, like for example, I will use a Merge lab when we're not, we would have maybe there's a lab that we do, that's minerals. We didn't have a set of minerals that I could work with, but with the Merge cube, they could see all the minerals. So you have to be selective in what you're bringing into the classroom and what you want for your kids, right? So that it's really based on you and your beliefs. And I'm one of those people that I do believe in getting the kids out to recess, getting them to socialize. You cannot keep them in the classroom. And when they're out of recess, I do tell them do not. You know, I allow them to use the phones in the classroom if we're doing it for educational purposes. If I have a QR code, they need to scan it and see a video, yes. But if we're outside at recess, they are leaving those phones in the classroom, in their book bags, and they're going to go ahead and socialize and 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 see each other face to face and have these conversations because it is important. No, definitely. Now I want to talk about state testing, right? Everyone, no one likes t- state tests and exams. Students don't like it. Adults don't like it. Uh, but test anxiety is real. In fact, it's estimated that thirty five percent of all students have moderate, high, or severe test anxiety. Can you share, because I, I know you have to prepare students for state testing, of course, especially in a fifth grade classroom, even at the fourth grade level. Can you share some advice and strategies you implement in the classroom to help students navigate test anxiety? Okay, so as I said before, I am a big believer in growth mindset and social emotional learning. So that starts on the very first day. Like I said, Class Soldier has some videos. I set them up for success and understanding that you have to be a risk taker and it's okay. So there's a very um, low, 
low anxiety. I don't want them to be anxious or nervous about these things. So I do certain things for them. So the videos, the posters, all of these things that we have conversations about this, for example, Fridays I would have with my students, Friday mornings, they would come in and we would watch. Um, I can't remember right now what was, but we would have these videos that would have like the news for the week and we'd come in and one of the, I had them broken up in groups and one of the groups would bring breakfast for the whole class. So we would eat breakfast together. We would discuss the news. We would, you know, like a family coming together. And so moments like that are really important. And I would have that throughout the week, throughout the year. So every Friday morning, they knew they could come in, have breakfast, have this conversation, ease our way into the day. And also, that's one thing. Another thing is test taking strategies, making sure that they are cognizant of what are these strategies and why we use them. And I would tell, I would also do some exercises with them, almost like yoga in the classroom, some brain breaks in between testing. So Fridays can be very heavy when you're having, I don't know, a quiz on reading and something else. On So in between those, we would do exercises. I would literally get them up and do some brain breaks. It could be a game. It could be exercises. And I would teach them how to do this. And I would allow them, even during state testing, there's like a break in between. I would tell them, you can do the exercises in between that break. You cannot talk to each other, but right. you can do exercises. So showing them how they can manage that anxiety is important. And the last but not least, I would make it almost like a fun thing. When testing happened, I would have these testing treats mm-hmm. and I would have a table full of testing treats. If it was writing, it would be, I told them one year, here's a pencil. And I told them what they know that I love science. And I said, oh my God, you know, I found out <laughs> this is not good. I hope my students don't see this because I lied to them. I told them. <laughs> I told them that the lead in the pencil was special and it would help us de-stress. Oh, that's nice. Day for writing and they were all excited to get these new pencils to work with. Um, the testing treats were great. We do it in between during that break. They're able to have a little snack, have a little something. Um, and then there would be some um, messages attached to these um, treats. So we're always looking forward and, you know, some of my students, once they left and go to middle school, they'd come back and say, hey, you know, we took the test this year and we were like looking forward to that little message and that little test. Um, And I would involve, I forgot this, this is actually the most important part. I would involve the parents in that. So like a few weeks before testing happened, I would send home a package (laughs) with uh, something for the math testing day, the reading and the science, which is what we test in fifth grade in, um, in writing, which is what we test here in Florida in fifth grade. And so I would have the families write notes to the kids. So when they came in morning, the notes were under a desk waiting for them, these encouraging notes saying, I know you're gonna do great, I believe in you. Yeah. So you see coming into the classroom and getting these notes either from your aunt, a friend, a parent. Right. And I have some, because to be quite honest, it's sad that some kids did not get those notes back. And that's the reality. So I would have some notes ready for them. I believe in you as a teacher. I know you're going to the great. And and just to let them know that this does not define you. This test does not define who you are. It does not measure potential. It does not measure how courageous you are and all of these other things that make up who you are. So having that type of environment, I think, um, creates success. And, and it gives us to go in there and be less stressed to take that test. Wow, I love that. My my question is, where were you <laughs> when I was a student? <laughs> I mean, I don't. That is so beautiful. I mean, that's such a great idea, by the way. Sending sending uh, parents home a packet to write a note to instill confidence. Wow, I I've I've never heard of that. I hope a lot of teachers are doing that. That is probably one of the most beautiful and positive things I've heard, which makes a genuine difference for students' confidence. Um, <laughs> Seriously, I've, I, I, I've, yeah, I, I need to think now back to my elementary school days or even middle school, but nothing like that. Wow, thank you, thank you for sharing that. That's really powerful. Thank you, and I think also, listen, a lot of this is from, believe it or not, and I know a lot of new teachers out there now are getting their PD from social media. Mm-hmm. They're going to social media and they're looking at what other teachers are doing. And um, I think part of that idea came from seeing someone sending like a science kit home. Mm -hmm. 
and it was right before testing and i thought oh i could send a sign science kit home and for some reason i was like wait why not i know and i encouraged the parents to decorate it and you you have to see if i had pictures you see some of the notes i come back with stickers and all this glitter on it and you know you open them the envelope and like these little glittery things come out of it like some of them really go out of their way yeah. to surprise the kids and make them feel welcome so I, actually that's my favorite part and and they're so happy to see that they come in the next day and they're looking forward to their little note you know yeah no thank you so much for sharing that great advice and and, and those great stories i do have one last question for you i want to share my screen over here so i also saw this on uh, let me see over here. I did see this on your social media. I love this uh, over here. This is a owl post over here. Can you explain what this is and uh, what students can do and why it's so great? Okay, so first of all, I am a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> and for the last like three or four years, my classroom was a Harry Potter themed classroom. Um, and so that bravery to stand up to your en enemies, but just as much to stand up to your friends. It takes bravery to stand up to your enemies, but just as much to stand up to your friends is a quote from Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And we was what that quote was at the beginning, the first week of school, and then I would introduce the mailbox, the owl post. It's because with Harry Potter, the owls deliver the post. Mm -hmm. And so this post box allows the kids to tell me anything that they want to tell me, whether they want to add a different activity, a theme to a classroom transformation, uh, something that's bothering them. They need help with something. A lot of kids, you're in fifth grade, are embarrassed to say that they don't understand something or they don't know. Even when you're trying to create an environment where it's okay to make mistakes, sometimes they're afraid to say it. Right. So this is a chance for you to write a note and put it in that mailbox and it's between you and me. No one has access to the mailbox because it's locked and I will open it and I will read it at the end of the day and I will get back to you. Maybe put the note in your desk hand it to you as you came in, um, you know, that helped a lot because if there was someone that didn't understand something, I could set up a time to help them. Or when they came to that DI doing groups, I knew what I needed to do with you. Sometimes they tell you the most amazing things and sometimes they just want to give you a compliment and say something nice, but it's also interrupting the instructional time. Right. So it cuts down on interruptions and it keeps the line of communication open for the students. So I and love that. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Wow, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you today. For the teachers that are watching or even parents, be sure to check out Tanya's incredible resources on uh, Teachers Pay Teachers under Gifted Teacher 305. Additionally, if you want to be in the loop and continue to see more amazing classroom ideas and transformation and even science experiments, be sure to follow Tanya on Instagram at Gifted Teacher 305. Tanya, thank you so much for being here today. It was such a pleasure getting to chat with you. Thank you so much for having me. This is um, a great opportunity just to be able to present educators and what we do and in a in a positive light because it's it's tough times. So thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Thank you.